Okay, I think it's eight o'clock. Um, well, welcome to uh, Moran Eye Center Grand Rounds. I'm Kathleen Digri, and I'm so pleased today to be able to introduce Dr. Dan Malia, who is a professor and head of the Visual Neuroscience Group at the Singapore Eye Research Institute. Um, he's also a professor of the Duke uh, uh, NUS Graduate Medical School in Singapore. He's a professor of ophthalmology at Angers University in France and an honorary professor at the Copenhagen University in Denmark. Uh, he did his medical school training in Salpetriere in Paris, France, uh, where he also completed a fellowship in neuroophthalmology, specializing in ophthalmology, and he has his PhD in neuroscience uh, as well. Uh, this lecture is so exciting because I think it really tells us where neuro-ophthalmology could be going in the future using artificial intelligence to help us understand and detect optic disc abnormalities. You know that we've been doing some artificial intelligence with retinal disorders, but this optic nerve and optic disc study is really exciting. He created this large international group called the BONSE, the Brain and Optic Nerve Study with Art Artificial Intelligence. And, and uh, if you haven't seen his paper that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, I highly recommend it. Dan, we are so grateful for you to come today and visit with us and uh, do grand rounds and, um, and tell us all about this exciting new work that's taking place. Thank you so much, Kathleen. It's really a high pleasure and privilege to be here with you. I, as, as you said, I'm just very sorry I couldn't make it in person. That would have been a wonderful opportunity, but I highly encourage you, if you happen to come to Asia, come and visit me. This is uh, uh, Singapore and, and the background. Uh, Singapore is a fantastic uh, city and country, very vibrant, a lot of energy, uh, lots of um, research and tomorrow's technologies. It's, it's an absolutely phenomenal environment. These are my financial disclosures. Um, and this is Singapore National Eye Center. Uh, it's a very big center and we are doing a lot of research on the right side. It's the uh, SERI, Singapore Eye Research Institution. And historically, uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, artificial intelligence for diabetic retinopathy. But before going into that, I would like to thank my uh, closest collaborators and partners in crime, Valerie Buse, Nancy Newman from the United States, uh, and locally, uh, this is Raymond Najjar, uh, Liu Yong, and Tianyin Wang, who are uh, my collaborators. This is my uh, visual neuroscience group at SERI, a very dynamic and I would say very diverse group. We're having uh, engineers, uh, neuroscientists, uh, biologists, uh, <coughs> sorry, lots of coordinators. And this is the group interested in artificial intelligence in ophthalmology, quite a big group. And ophthalmologists are probably the minority of, of this group. It's a, a very interesting setup. So let me start with a case. This is a patient we saw uh, uh, last week uh, or 10 days ago. And now uh, Kathleen very kindly introduced Bonsai. Bonsai is the brain and optic nerve study uh, with artificial intelligence. So basically we're testing pretty much every image. Every patient who comes in our clinic has pictures taken of his fundus and we're testing <clears throat> if possible in real time uh, the, 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 the algorithm, trying to understand what does the algorithm say compared to what do we say. And it's interesting because for this patient who had a recent onset of headache, the way the algorithm displays the results is the following, is saying, uh, right, we're doing another thing, which I'm pretty, it's, it's probably interesting to note, is that we're also trying to take pictures with a, a portable camera to try to do this in real time to make things easier. So this is how the, the results are displaying. <clears throat> the machine provides a probability for a disc being normal, papilledema, or others. And in this case, it was quite interesting because the machine did not say papilledema. It says it's certainly not normal, very, very low probability in each eye. Papilledema also very, very low, more so in the left eye than in the right eye. 
But the machine said, this is others. This is not popular demand. This is not normal. And interestingly enough, the resident forgot to take the blood pressure and this was just malignant hypertension. So this tells us a bit of what the machine can do. And I think it can be easy to misdiagnose uh, <clears throat> this fundus with papilledema by non-expert ophthalmologists. That's why our question was, is there a place for artificial intelligence in neuro-ophthalmology for optic disc abnormality detection, especially when we're dealing with optic discs that are <clears throat> not overtly swollen, like in this case, which nevertheless, you know, this could be a free sending two or three, but however, there could be a, a life-threatening condition that, that is underlying. Uh, so let me tell you a story that made a lot of noise in the UK. You probably heard about the story. This is a kid who uh, went to an optometry shop in the UK. He had an absolutely normal examination and he was uh, discharged after having glasses. But this became big news a couple of months later in the BBC because the child died from undiagnosed hydrocephalus. And when looking back at the pictures, there was papilledema that was misdiagnosed by the optometrist. And the optometrist ended up being <coughs> convicted. That was revised later. But you can imagine how uh, much emotion is around uh, the, that situation. And I don't have to tell you that this was followed immediately by a very high peak of prescript, uh, prescriptions of MRI, absolutely unnecessary MRIs. So this is the context in which I think that uh, fundus photographs could have a place. Uh, for instance, the emergency room, and this is Valerie Buse and Nancy Newman and the DARE team who did extensive studies about this. And I'm just citing one of their papers in neurology. They're showing that there's a variety of optic disc abnormalities in the emergency room. So patients coming in with neurological symptoms or visual loss or high blood pressure, 12% of them, which is quite considerable, have a normal disc and 3% have disc swelling. So our question was, could AI in Singapore, could AI identify abnormal optic discs for non-specialists? Well, the problem was, I was told, don't even think about it. We have 500,000 images of diabetic retinopathy uh, in Singapore. Um, of course, the number of papilledema images were considerably lower. But we thought it might be a solution to this, and this is collect worldwide. Go and do a big study with all the friends, all the neuro-ophthalmologists, which I think are a very special population. We created the Bonsai Consortium, Brain and Optic Nerve Study with AI. We have now more than 30,000 images uh, in 30 centers, 20 countries, with an incredible variety of images coming from all the places, from India, from Asia, from Russia, from the United States, even from Africa. And of course, ethnicity is a big issue uh, in order to be sure that the machine is, is performing <clears throat> equally well in all sorts of populations. So these are a few of the collaborators. Uh, I apologize, not all of them are here, but you certainly can recognize Valerie and Nancy, probably Neil Miller, John Chen, Patrick Uy Man, and many, many others um, from the United States. And just to remind you before going to the results, how to conduct an AI study. We're training a system. So the system is exposed to image, a variety of images with a very strong ground truth diagnosis. And the machine is literally learning from these images. And then once we feel comfortable that this has achieved a reasonable <clears throat> performance, the system is tested in an external data set and images that have never been seen by the first system of the training. So training followed by testing. And we created a, a, a CNN, a convolutional neural network, uh, first for segmentation of the disks and then for their classification. I don't want to go into details, but we had expert, wonderful uh, engineers doing all the AI work. And the output of our system was to look at images if the disks were normal, papilledema, or other optic disk abnormalities. I don't want to go too much into the inclusion criteria, but what is interesting is that we had not only ophthalmic diagnosis, but also general diagnosis, like for instance, venous sinus thrombosis, et cetera. 
And this is a retrospective collection of more than 15,000 images, multiple cameras. We try to um, uh, mitigate the risk of uh, bias, of course. And then we were testing in five totally independent countries. What was very nice, I think, in our study is that we had a very strong reference standard. We, did no, we didn't look at images saying, oh, this is papilledema. That's not the way we did it. We looked at every single patient at brain imaging, at uh, CSF opening pressures, at everything that we could do to be sure that our reference diagnosis is strong, that that was papilledema and not a pseudopapilledema, for instance, which I think made our study quite strong. And these are the uh, some technical uh, uh, details. I don't think they are very interesting. What is probably more interesting though is that we included almost 10,000 normals 2,500 papilledemas, and I think that's quite considerable. I don't think any human has seen 2,500 images of papilledema. Our computer did and remembers every single detail. And other optic disc abnormalities, quite considerable numbers to come to 15,000. And this is how, the way our, our <clears throat> API shows the results. So we're just uploading the image, and on the right side of the slide, you can see the probability that the machine comes up with. So in this case, it's quite obvious that papilledema, the probability is 95.6. And we always encourage the clinician to make his own choice. This is just an assistant. This system does not take into account clinical signs like headache or tinnitus or other things that could be quite interesting. Um, but in this case, for instance, obviously the system says 95%, this is papilledema, very confident. The system makes the diagnosis on one eye only, not at the uh, patient level, but at the eye level. And if this is quite obvious in this case, I think it's less obvious in this case where the picture is a bit um, not very clear. There is a probably a lower free sense, a very deep, papilledema, yet look at the system, it's still 95%. Why? Because the system has seen so many images. I think a human would be less confident that, than that. And I'll come back about it later. And this is another image, an example of optic disc atrophy. And the system feels very comfortable, 100%. Uh, I, I'm always a bit worried when the system says 100%, but in this case, I have no worries to agree with it. 100% um, this was optic disc atrophy. Now the results, they are uh, expressed as a, the performance as area under the curve. I'm sure you are familiar. Uh, uh, zero 0.5 would be a straight line, which is due to chance. And the higher, uh, the better, of course. And these are the heat maps. We're trying to understand what is the system looking at when it feels so comfortable about calling this papilledema, for instance. And these are the external data sets we did five data sets in, um, in Bangkok in the United States, in Copenhagen and Tehran in Germany, and look at the curves for identifying papilledema, the system, the area under the curve is 0 0.96, which is really very good. And what's interesting is that we had several curves for each of the five centers, as you can see here on the right side, and they are quite superposable, I think. Now, what's interesting, I understand that this is, um, uh, an audience of neurologists predominantly. So my neurology uh, uh, partners, they said, you know, papilledema is great, but we're probably even more interested to know that the discs are really normal. And the error of the curve for that is 0 0.98. So the negative predictive value is very high, meaning that if the system says this is normal, the chances are really very high for an optic disc to be normal. And again, I'm talking about neurologists who are not very familiar to do ophthalmoscopy or not very, don't feel very comfortable about doing it, yet they highly need that. And as Kathleen has kind of alluded, uh, we have published this uh, two years ago um, in, in the New England Journal of, of, of Medicine. I think not so much because the paper had that intrinsic high value, it's because the, this is the, for the first time that a system could connect the eye with the brain, making inferences about papilledema and intracranial problems. Now, one of the questions we asked ourselves, is the machine making errors? And well, it's interesting, the answer is yes, obviously, but very often we had to agree with the machine. Let's say, for instance, a provider would give us an image and the 
the machine would say something different than what the provider was giving us. And in front of this discrepancy, sometimes we have to go back to the provider saying, you know, are you sure? Because we pretty much agree more with the machine. And this is an email that I received in 2019. I think it's quite cool. And the provider is saying, oh, sorry for my mistake. This was a, a coding error. Your machine is better than me. Your machine is better than me. Is this our future? Should we be worried about this? Are the machines going to be more performant? We are, we can discuss about that at the end. A second step, you probably recognize Nancy Newman and Valerie Buse. They came to Singapore in an incredible challenge to fight against the computer. And yet, although this was, I have to say, I'm sorry if this is recorded, but this was quite tense. Yet they kept their smile and they were very fair players. And they had this competition against the computer, looking at 800 images. And the time of value or Nancy ranked between 74 to 61 minutes, the machine 25 seconds, obviously we're talking about 800 images. And the accuracy was quite similar, I have to say. But this is interesting. That means that our system, at least on this data set, was at least as good as two expert neuro-ophthalmologists who had absolutely no clinical information. Subsequently, we published a different <coughs> story trying to classify the papilledema severity into two classes. We simplified the free sen, and that worked quite well. We published that in neurology. And what we're doing now, we're trying to compare the performance of the system with non-ophthalmologists. Non and obviously, this, is, this horizontal line is the performance of the system. So it's around 15% errors. And look, everybody else neurologists, ED, internists, everybody does higher uh, numbers of errors compared to the machine. Now we're also doing a perspective study that we reported at the uh, North American Neurothomal Society in February. I don't think this has much interest. It's just to say that even studied prospectively in consecutive patients, our system performs fairly well and its performance drops only marginally. And let me finish with one case. Again, a case, a real uh, a live case that we saw, we tested. We didn't see the patient, but we tested those images received from some providers. And again, in this situation, uh, the system was said, this is not normal. Papilledema, not normal, but it is probably others. It's not normal. It's not papilledema. And then we're developing a new system. We discussed about this with Kathleen. If this is an ischemic optic neuropathy because it was an acute onset in both eyes, the next step, interesting step, would be to try to compare the probability of being AAION and GCA or NAION. And guess what? The probability of being AION, I'm sorry, the, the display was very high. And this is exactly what happened. This was AAION related to uh, uh, giant cell arteritis that was proven later. So uh, the future, I don't know about the future. I think handheld cameras uh, might have a role. Uh, this is the way we're looking at every single patient now because having a proof of what we're seeing is important and also applying bonsai on an image in real time, it's an important thing for us. Could one day those cameras have an embedded AI that could provide an instant diagnosis? That would be absolutely wonderful. Could other machines benefit from AI for neuroph applications? We don't know yet. But I think the uh, future holds for uh, AI neuroph probably improve diagnosis. Uh, we don't know if we can predict one day outcomes and why not? We can always dream some treatment recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. Thank you so much for that really interesting talk. And uh, so we have time for questions. Um, I asked him to leave some time because this is such a hot topic in neuro-ophthalmology. Um, I'd like to start out by asking you about one of the enigmas for us in neuro-ophthalmology and also pediatric ophthalmology is trying to discern Barry Drusen from papilledema. Oh. Right. What what did the AI, what did your AI system, what could it do with Barry Jusen? That that's an excellent question. And it's it's I have another talk, which is 20 minutes about that only, but I don't <laughs> think that so it's it's a very hot topic, absolutely. So we do we did look specifically at that. So we had something like three thousand papilledema images and something like a thousand optic disk drusen. 
And we, for this purpose, we choose to make an alliance with the members of the uh, Druze and study with Stefan Hallman, with uh, Fiona Costello, um, with Claire, with Valerie, with many others. And guess what? The performance is super high. It depends what we're looking at. So looking at severe papilledema, comparing severe papilledema, let's say Frisen 5, against visible optic disdrusen, the performance is close to 100%. And I mean, any new resident can make that uh, difference. But then we're looking at different subclasses, the performance drops. I mean, unsurprisingly, looking at free, for lower Frisen grade, uh, versus, let's say, up, buried optic disdrusen, the performance drops. Yet, it is above area under the curve. I think we're above 90%. We're writing up a manuscript about that. Uh, and, and you are absolutely right. The, the, I think the right question is in the hands of pediatric ophthalmologists who really see those buried drusen. If it's, if it's a calcified drusen, I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, although, sometimes... I mean, Drusen and Papilima can coexist. Good. Did I answer your question? Yes, that's that was just great. We're also very excited about your study about AION and arteritic AION, because right. as you know, that is such a critical difference. And AION often also is confused with uh, optic neuritis and uh, having those two. So uh, I, have you got a study going on comparing optic neuritis and uh, AION. Right, that's very interesting. So the answer is no. The answer is no for that, for two reasons, uh, which are geographic reasons to start with, is for some bizarre reason, AION is extremely rare in Asia and optic neuritis is just as much. So we probably will have a very skewed population here uh, looking at uh, NMOs and MOG optic, which are more common than the common optic neuritis. Uh, but we also feel that the critical, I mean, how often do you really hesitate between AION, NAION and optic neuritis? I think this is a, quite a small population, age 40, a bit atypical. So if you want to do a very clean study, we would have to train only on this population, and the, the numbers will be extremely small. We thought about that, that very, very carefully, and I think we might do it, but it's a bit early for now, just because we don't have access to the right populations. However, as what you said, AAION versus NAION, we are looking at that with, you know, very intensely, and the results are promising. I don't have definite results yet. Um, but again, we have a number of limitations because it was looking only at the acute onset, although patients can come two, three days later and we wouldn't know how to, I mean, we're, we're excluding those for, for, for now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brad Katz has asked, at what point will the machine be able to use clinical information to help narrow down the diagnosis or able to ask questions about the patient's presentation, which is an interesting thing to take the, the image and then apply it to the situation. Right. Hey, Brad, nice, nice to, to, to hear from you. Uh, yeah, so that's a very interesting, critical question. So I still think we're doing the first baby set, uh, steps and we did not take into account clinical data because we are not sure what sort of clinical data are we gonna get. We probably will have to do this with only highly selected centers. You know, we have centers from literally uh, patients from 30 centers. Looking at retrospective data, we are very worried that we might have dirty or un inaccurate data. So, you know, how do we know if the patient really had headache or a pain in eye movements? Uh, missing data is a big problem in AI. So that's why we did, we prefer to limit ourselves to images, but that is absolutely the future. I fully agree. Uh, Dr. Olson, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, 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 incredible presentation. And, and obviously AI is gonna be powerfully important in regards to the future and what we're all gonna deal with. But a lot of data sets, uh, sadly, as you mentioned, are dirty and, uh, uh, where you have a garbage in, garbage out problem, uh, then AI uh, essentially doesn't have a very good ability to differentiate. So 
I think that ability to really make sure that you've got very clean sets. Uh, <clears throat> I look at, for instance, uh, some of the data mining in association with uh, billing records. And uh, um, in, in, in many instances, uh, and, and the one that uh, I know that uh, is, is probably one of the dirtiest would be glaucoma, that uh, probably <clears throat> a third to a half of the people who have glaucoma are being diagnosed as normals right now. And that of those that are diagnosed with glaucoma, many probably don't have glaucoma. So uh, where you've got those kind of data sets that you're doing and, and they're not clean, then AI obviously is gonna have a much, much lower predictive value. So we, we need to appreciate the fact that this is a, um, a, not just grab huge data sets that everything will be resolved and we'll be able to answer any tough question. There's a, there's a lot of work going in to make sure that the data sets that are there are accurate and clean. And then you can get, these kind of results and, and they're gonna be extremely helpful and particularly helpful to see that important diagnoses are not missed. I 100% agree with you. On the other hand, our approach has its um, downsides as well. You know, being too clean makes us going away from the real world and that's the next step. You know, how yeah. much does a wonderful study, you know, super clean study will apply then to a real world. And that's what we're trying to do now in a perspective study. Uh, so far, it looks pretty good, uh, but that, that is the ultimate challenge to translate those methods into real world to make real use of them. Sure. No, good point. Other questions um, from anybody else? You know, in the New York Times today, it said AI, when is it going to, when is it going to start um, having a return on investment. Oh. So I would say to you, Dan, when do you think we'll be using these schema in our emergency rooms and also, uh, especially with papilledema in neurology offices or primary care offices? Right. That's a very good question. So I think to people like you and me, it's quite obvious that the ability to discriminate between optic disc and papilledema should be very useful but there is no cost effectiveness study that has been done. We have to show that, you know, uh, using this system, if it works, uh, will save us money in terms of less MRIs, unnecessary MRIs, or targeting better our patients. So there is still, I, I'm afraid, uh, a, a long way to, to show that this is cost effective. That's great. Any other questions from, um, anybody, you can unmute yourself and or feel free to put it in the chat. Hi, Kathleen. This is Jeff Petty. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for this talk. It's extraordinary. It's really exciting. Uh, I have a, two questions. First one I'll ask, you know, we 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 get our pretest probability, you know, on our clinical examination. And that, of course, then goes to guide whether or not we order MRIs, et cetera. And in this particular case where, you know, we're given an actual number now, it, it seems as if the, you know, the thing about type one errors, type two errors, not wanting to miss the brain tumor, it, it seems like a lot of the, the clinical decision-making of simply to order an MRI or not, to you know, do a lumbar puncture or not, that that could be fairly algorithmic at this point. You mentioned about the emergency departments. Do you, do you envision at some point this being uh, utilized as, you know, your screen, you just automatically go through a, 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 a physician-less process until we get that information at the end? Absolutely, I think that, that, would, be, that would be the, uh, the, the, the gold thing. So uh, as you know, we're, we're, you have to deal with sensitivity and specificity. So for now, and th those things have to be tailored for the users. So I would say, as you mentioned, for an emergency department, you don't want to miss. So probably you're gonna go for a very high sensitivity and just raise the bar for the higher sensitivity. And the risk is that it will have probably less specificity and there will be some unnecessary um, findings, you know, you know, falsely diagnosed papilledema. So those things have to be tailored according to the department where you want to use them. But ultimately I fully agree it, this, I mean, I have so many, 
collaborators and emails from, from the world saying, you know, we do not have access to an ophthalmologist at two o'clock in the morning and a patient with heavy headache. We only have access to one machine. Can you just license the, the, the algorithm to us and we'll use it? The answer is no, because there has to be approvals, all sorts of regulatory issues. But I think that there is a big demand worldwide. Probably not so much in the US, you know, in high academic centers, but in more peripheral centers, I would say so. Well, I would say even in our academic center, you know, saving our neuro-ophthalmologists from having to leave their clinics to enter into our clinics to tell us if it's uh, pepalidema or not, I think they would welcome that even at our center. Agree, agree. fully agree. Uh, just, just one other question then. So, so you know, you used a supervised model, uh, you know, where the inputs were clearly okay. identified, very rigorous, very impressive. Question I have is, were there any particular categories that started to flush out where uh, the algorithm, you know, was not as accurate? I mean, any kind of subsets of, of categories where it, it showed a little bit less confidence or was, was yeah. it able to pretty much yes. um, just, just be accurate through, throughout the broad cross-section? Excellent question. So, uh, as I said, we really wanted to have superbly clean, clean data. And this is not the real world. So let's say, as you say, a diagnosis with less confidence were, let's say, optic disc swelling, papilledema, with some atrophy. You know, older or chronic papilledema, the, the performance drops immediately because we taught the machine on purpose only with fresh papilledemas. So uh, other categories were mixed diagnosis. We had, a, for instance, pa a few patients with combined drusen and papilledema. The machine was all over the place, didn't know how to handle that, um, that sort of things. Great. Dr. Warner has her hands up. Judith Warner. Good morning, and thank you, Dan. That's a great topic. Um, Good morning, Judith. I, I, love, I love it. Um, and uh, um, I, I, I feel like we're sort of working uh, peripherally to try and get some of our uh, uh, giant cell and AION patients to you, although I, I don't know to. how we are. That. That. But um, uh, the, the, the comment, it's really more of a comment, less than a question. The comment that I had is, because um, I don't know if my ophthalmology colleagues who are on the line here know that we had a handheld non midriatic camera for use in the emergency room. And uh, Sean uh, Cullen has actually been a uh, rolling that out to a variety of other places like the uh, the um, People's Clinic up in uh, uh, Park City and uh, down at Navajo. Um, but uh, how do you see the um, non midriatic camera uh, playing a role in um, urgent diagnosis in the emergency room? I, I know that Valerie and her group did a study of that at, um, um, at Emory and found it to be uh, very um, eye-opening mm -hmm. as to uh, how often diagnoses were missed. Right, uh, absolutely. So you're, you're, you're spot on. So in that study, this photo ED, she found 13% uh, of optic disc abnormalities. Now I think we, so there has been a lot of controversy about portable cameras because the periphery is not very well seen. Um, but I think we're lucky because we are, we are looking precisely at the optic disc at the posterior pole. So what we're doing is we're doing a segmentation. So we're just extracting literally the optic disc. We don't care too much. That's why when providers are sending us saying, you know, do one 30, 45 degrees, we're fine with anything as long as we can extract the optic disc image. So what we're doing now, we're doing a pilot study. We trained, Bonsai was trained on midriatic images on desktop, wonderful Rolls-Royce conditions. But now we're trying to apply that algorithm uh, to its poor uh, uh, brother, which would be non-midriatic images with a handheld camera. And so far it looks quite okay. But if you guys have that camera, and if it's still a possibility to collaborate, I think it would be a very, very cool study to do, mainly to, to test our, uh, our primary uh, bonsai algorithm on non midriatic images with a handheld camera. I, I think that's where the future is gonna have to be because uh, not everybody has the fancy cameras that we 
have the luxury of having an ophthalmology. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Dan, so, unfortunately, think, yeah. Oh, sorry, Dora. Unfortunately, I think our camera got dropped and is currently back in, uh, okay. in, in, in its home country getting fixed, but uh, hopefully we'll have it back soon. Yeah. Dan, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. This was really extraordinary. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited to have had you here. You can stay for the rest of our Grand Rounds uh, if you wish, but I know you have, fam you have family uh, obligations as well. So next, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Kasky, who is our current neuro-ophthalmology fellow. Dr. Kasky has been really outstanding, uh, uh, bad, uh, amazing multitasker, helping us all uh, in neuro-ophthalmology. Uh, he's gonna be heading out to the Wheaton Eye Clinic in Illinois, going back to the Midwest where his roots are. Uh, but today he's gonna talk to us about his photophobia curriculum project. And we're excited to have you here, uh, Dan. Thank you, or uh, Eric. Thank you so much for for giving us this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Grady. Thank you for the introduction. And Dan, that was fantastic. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, so my research this year has been about photophobia, and um, this has been presented at Neuroophthalmology Society meeting this year. Um, and I'll kind of dig into that and as well as the second project that we worked on, uh, this curriculum that you may have heard of recently. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. So the group here at Utah has been focusing somewhat on pediatric photophobia. Uh, Dr. Buchanan and the group here recently published this uh, retrospective review of 36 pediatric patients that presented with the primary complaint of photophobia and found that uh, large majority or 70% uh, left the clinic without a specific diagnosis for their symptom. And I think most of us are familiar that pediatric photophobia is a difficult thing to uh, work up and make a diagnosis on being both uncommon and uh, potentially a sign of something pretty serious. Um, so uh, that's something that we wanted to look further into uh, this year. So uh, we were hoping to better understand why this was happening. And we're all you know, pretty competent eye providers here at RAN. So uh, we wanted to delve a little more into this, uh, see if we're making progress over the years, if patients are still leaving undiagnosed um, and use a larger patient population as well to see uh, what the presumed causes of these patients' photophobia are. And we wanted to hopefully identify some knowledge gaps that could help us to educate ourselves and future ophthalmologists to better handle this condition. So we ran a retrospective chart review of all pediatric visits uh, with photophobia as a diagnosis from 2016 to 2021 at the University of Utah facilities. We had 304 visits identified and 125 of those were unique patients. Uh, so those were uh, the ones that were analyzed. For the demographics, it was a pretty even split amongst the age groups. Um, and we wanted to delve into some of the associations as well. Uh, it was very even with male and female. Migraine was a common uh, associated condition as well as traumatic head injury and dry eye. And some of the things that we commonly think of in ophthalmology with autoimmune disease and blepharospasm were present, but not as common as the others. So uh, right into our results here, the, similar to other studies that have looked into this, the most common cause is idiopathic, unknown uh, in about a third of the patients, uh, better than the previous uh, review, but um, still the highest percentage. Uh, migraine was very common, especially in the older age groups. And uh, otherwise there was a widespread and many different things that could cause photophobia, uh, including dry eye, head injury, uh, blepharitis and other abnormalities, aniridia, dry eye, uh, and many others. Uh, including uh, some more serious things. There are two pediatric glaucomas, two inherited retinal diseases, and three intracranial masses. Uh, so that would be about 4.6% of the patient population that we studied. And treatment is uh, directed towards symptom management and the underlying cause. Uh, tinted lenses were recommended in a little less than half of patients. Uh, and observation was the only thing in about 21%, as uh, frequently the eye exam is, is normal. So that was 
um, common, especially in the young patients. Ocular surface disease and headache management uh, were commonly uh, addressed, and there were some surgical interventions, and that's where most of the other uh, treatments come in. I want to focus in a little bit on the children less than five years old, as those are the most difficult patients to examine and diagnose. And this is where a lot of the unknowns came in. Uh, greater than half of the patients less than five uh, didn't have an identified cause for their apparent uh, photophobia. Migraine, of course, was much less common. Um, and then there was quite a spread of uh, other things that were associated. So our conclusions were that about a third of the patients uh, in the study uh, still don't have a cause of their photophobia. The second third is headache related, migraines especially, uh, as, as the main cause. And then the last third is some other identifiable cause. And that includes the, the high morbidity uh, disorders like uh, congenital glaucoma, inherited retinal dystrophies, and intracranial masses. Our study is limited by its retrospective design and uh, being a referral center, we may collect the more difficult to diagnose patients or the more high morbidity causes. Um, also, this was ICD-10 code based for selection of the patients. And as you may know, there's not a specific ICD-10 code for photophobia. It falls under visual disturbance, uh, which so we may miss some patients and collect some others that are not quite exactly what we were looking for. And we don't have a good follow-up for our treatment, so um, we don't know if what we're doing is really working or helping the patients with their symptoms and their quality of life. And that's where we're going to go next. So uh, we're, especially with the unknown um, diagnoses, the you know, re-examine those patients and figure out the natural course for this photophobia, evaluate our treatment if someone's undergone and if a diagnosis uh, was identified uh, at a later date. So that's uh, will be upcoming. But um, the follow-up for this is this curriculum that was designed to help address this knowledge gap for photophobia, especially in the pediatric population. Um, so along with the team here, we've put together this um, for the providers here. So as we just heard, the photophobia frequently being undiagnosed, even though we're all you know, pretty competent at our jobs. Um, so there must be something that we're missing to uh, that we can address. So we made a multimedia curriculum for residents and um, providers for, um, for making better care, more prompt care for these patients. Our objective is to make a validated curriculum that can be widely available for use around the world as uh, the education mission for Moran. Um, so hopefully after completing the curriculum, the participants can explain anatomy and pathophysiology of photophobia to patients as well as their parents, uh, be able to describe an approach to uh, making a diagnosis and knowing the most common causes and then uh, to discuss photophobia treatment options, of which there are quite a few. Uh, so uh, we really wanted to make a special emphasis on a child with an otherwise normal ophthalmologic exam as those are our most difficult um, ones to diagnose. And we wanted to make it uh, useful and efficient for uh, our busy lifestyle. So it's a self-paced combination of some reading, a video lecture and some interview style podcasts. And we're using a pre and post test quiz to help measure uh, that learning has taken place. So we have made 20 pre-test questions based on the didactic material, which includes two articles by the group here, and, and as well as a video lecture that is available on Moran Core currently. And then the uh, Didactic pad podcasts uh, include Dr. Katz and Dr. Degree and myself uh, talking about the approach to photophobia, the appropriate exam and workup, and uh, the treatment options. And then the participants would take a, the same 20 uh, quiz questions uh, to uh, give us an idea that we're making some progress, uh, but also get some feedback from the learner to know that we're uh, what we're doing well and what we're 
uh, not doing so well. So again, we have this curriculum now available uh, for um, participants to take part in uh, to address this knowledge gap of pediatric photophobia. And once it's validated, uh, this curriculum can potentially kick off a new facet of Moran Core uh, it's, and its educational platform with a symptom-based instruction. So uh, look out for similar symptom-based curriculums in the near future. So to become involved, uh, everyone that is a uh, that's faculty, resident, or fellow is invited to participate. You will be held anonymous and blinded from the investigators. So it won't show up on your feedback reviews at the end of the rotation. Um, so stop by the fourth floor clinical research office during clinic hours. Uh, you can ask the group there for the photophobia curriculum, uh, pretest, and its didactic content. And once you complete the curriculum, you'll complete the post test and you can collect your $100 Amazon gift card um, to use at your own uh, perusal. But also, you'll advance the education uh, of world of eye providers worldwide uh, as well as your own. So um, hopefully, that is enough incentive. We've had some early feedback uh, that it was educational and useful. It takes between two hours and three hours, depending on how quickly you read and how, uh, how much you fast forward uh, the uh, podcast. But um, we would certainly welcome more feedback to know how we can improve. I want to thank the whole neuroophthalmology team here, especially Dr. Katz and Dr. Degree for their direct participation in the podcast. Uh, Dr. Warner, Dr. C, and Dr. Crum for feedback on uh, both projects. Uh, Arena for helping me with the, the presentations. Jans Arman is a medical student that helped with some of the data collection. And our clinical research team for helping to run this. Great. Thank you so much, Eric. That, that's really wonderful. And I hope everybody will sign up. It's not hard to sign up. Just go to the fourth floor and uh, get the pretest and sign up. Um, are there any questions for Dr. Kasky? Dan. Excellent talk, thank you so much, Eric. I, I, can I have a, a naive question, please? Do you have any longitudinal data? Could this be a maturation problem in children in the old IPRGC melanopsin story? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, try not to delve too much into the the nuts and bolts of why photophobia happens because that's um, you know, a big part of the curriculum. So hopefully they want to give me spoilers. All right. Uh, but we don't have any, any longitudinal uh, component of the study quite yet. We had the previous study, which was um, similar to mine, you know, limited in its, in its scope. But um, that is something that we hope to figure out some more as we have this follow-up study with um, re-examining these patients years later and seeing if, is this just something that resolves on its own? Is there, uh, is there something that is diagnosed later? Do our treatments make any difference? Uh, so there's still a lot to, to figure out in the, kind of the real world of how this photophobia works. Uh, Brad Katz has his hand up. Unmute yourself, Brad. Ah, thanks. Thanks, Eric. And thanks, Dan, for uh, being here this morning. Uh, so we just got an approval from the IRB to go back and look at those 30 pediatric patients who uh, left the clinic without a diagnosis, and without a treatment plan. And we're going to be calling them up this summer. We've got a couple of medical students that are going to be helping us. And we'll bring them back to um, see if we can figure out what was the cause of their photophobia. Uh, and we'll use that information to help direct the curriculum. And, you know, the long-term goal, of course, is to improve our ability to diagnose and treat this condition in kids and also adults uh, eventually. Uh, but I want to encourage everybody, this, this, um, uh, this study that Eric is doing, um, it's, it's a curriculum for ophthalmologists, optometrists, um, uh, residents, fellows, faculty, everybody can be in the study. You get a $100 Amazon gift card at the end. And if you play the podcasts at 2x speed and play my video at 2x speed, you can get through it in under two hours. We sound like chipmunks, but, but otherwise uh, uh, you get the information, uh, direct information. Um, you know, I, um, 
I'm going to be very interested to find out how many of those 30 kids have have a migraine background because I think the migraine story is so underdiagnosed in our clinics, um, and children don't always have headache, uh, and and so the photophobia could be part of their migraine, just as babies have colic, uh, which is migraine, and uh, kids have car sickness as a child, which is migraine, and uh, and so the photophobia piece of this, um, you know, may end up being a lot of migraine. We'll have to see. Um, I'm very anxious to see the results of this. Any other questions from all of you? Dan. I'm sorry, but it's such a chance to be with you. I don't, I, I don't want to take advantage of it. So uh, about tinted glasses. So are you doing some trials about that? Or you know, are you tailoring this to the filtering spectrum or how do you deal with those? So Dr. Katz um, has got a couple studies ongoing. Do you want to take that question there, Brad? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, that's a little bit uh, tricky, you know, because because um, uh, I have a conflict of interest there. And okay. so I've really not been, e even though, you know, we think that FL41 is very effective uh, for a lot of these conditions, including migraine, blepharospasm, even traumatic brain injury, uh, we're not studying that directly. Um, I am uh, uh, collaborating with a company in Canada called Avalux that's uh, trying to develop the FL41 technology a little bit further to make it uh, more directed towards intrinsically photosensitive uh, retinal ganglion cells. And they have done a small pilot study in a cohort of patients with episodic migraine. And I, I hope to publish those data soon. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And, you know, FL41 uh, was developed in England, actually, uh, by a group uh, that uh, studied this back, oh, gee, in the early 80s, uh, late 70s and early 80s, and published it a long time ago. And um, we, um, I had come across the article many years ago and then introduced that to our optical center. So We've been using it. We have studied uh, FL41, for example, in blepharospasm. We also did a trial in, in migraine um, um, using uh, something uh, similar. And uh, so I think there's work to be done in this area. It's a really tricky area to study. As you know, migraine number one is tricky. <laughs> What's your, you know, what is the outcome? What's going to be the primary outcome? And, um, but, it, but it's an interesting area that that I think has a lot of potential to study. And on the other hand, I feel that in Europe and even more in Asia, the, the, the therapeutic options are re really low. The, the, we don't offer much to those patients. So uh, I would love to hear more. I mean, we can take this offline. Yeah, well, it's a, it, as you know, it's been a passion for, for me and for us. Yeah, so uh, uh, it's an interesting topic. Um, any other questions for Eric? Otherwise we're gonna be giving everybody a few minutes back to their day. I just want to thank everybody for a great presentation on issues that often are somewhat ignored, and in particular, the photophobia. These people just quietly suffer, and I'm proud of the group here. They're really trying to figure out what's going on. Um, the, the thought that everybody that's in that category has some element of dry eye. I mean, there's this whole thing of, a, of the super sensitivity uh, corne corneal syndrome associated. I mean, we're, we're digging into areas that I think have just been ignored by organized ophthalmology for a long, long time. Yeah, that's for sure. I think the cornea has more clues for us. So I encourage all the cornea people to keep working on this too from that end, because it's the highest density of trigeminal nerve endings in the entire body, which connects right to the trigeminal nuclei in the brainstem, which has a lot to do with migraine. So um, it's stay tuned. I think there's gonna be a lot. I hope there's gonna be a lot of work on this. I wish we could do something with AI in this area because it's so cloudy, but until we get our, until we can have a clearer vision, it's gonna be very difficult to, to study. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, it's been there in front of us for a long time where we've seen patients who have maybe dry eye, but but essentially nothing. And they're absolutely miserable. And we see others with significant 
dry eye uh, changes you think and they're saying no I'm, that doesn't bother me I'm, I'm actually pretty comfortable my vision's fine so you know the thought that we we had somehow assumed in all of that there wasn't another answer is was was clearly naive so anyway yeah. we're digging into it and that's good yeah dr warner unmute yourself judith Oh. Judith, you're not often okay. muted. So please. Yeah, I know it, it take it. I have to be allowed to unmute. So sorry, I was I was trying. I was trying. So I think I, I, it's uh, important to have a shout out to Kathleen for all the work that she's done uh, with um, her colleagues around the country and around the world, but also right here with our fellows, you know, that really terrific study on uh, the um, corneal nerves in in patients with uh, uh, photophobia and migraine it was it was just uh, uh, you know really trying to bring migraine down to the to the microscopic level and I think one of the most important uh, findings out of this and has been shown before is that the the overlap of symptoms of dry eye and signs of dry eye in migraine and in other conditions are actually very very poor so um, just asking people about their dry eye symptoms does not give you the full answer. Um, and uh, um, I think that the, the overlap of symptoms is uh, probably a, a clue. It's probably gonna what, what's gonna lead us in the right direction. I probably, Kathleen, you have a much more erudite approach to that comment. Well, I, um, I think that we just have to keep studying it more and um, recognize that this trigeminal system is not just in the brain alone. Uh, and uh, the trigeminal system innervates the eye and the orbit and everything else. And it's gonna be susceptible people that are going to have some problem with this because not everybody as uh, Dr. Olson said that has dry eyes gets photophobia. It's uh, really interesting. That would be almost an interesting study it's in itself to do. It would, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you for joining us. We really loved having you here for Grand Rounds. And thank, thank you, you all. Uh, Eric, you did a superb job as always. Um, everything you do is very good. And, um, and thank you to all of my colleagues who joined us today to hear some updates in neuro-ophthalmology. Thanks so much. Thank you.